Hi, I'm Jenna King, and I'm really excited to be sharing um, the science with you today. And I'm so impressed by everybody on this call and everything that you're doing for Mother Earth. And, you know, the science is so important to get people's minds and their hearts open because I think when you talk about regenerative agriculture, you know, this is a nature based solution. And we really need to support her with this research and to make sure the messaging is strong. And I think we need to speak for all the co-benefits of regenerative agriculture, soil fertility and restoring ecosystems. And you know, I've been supporting composting now for the last couple of years, supporting um, people that are doing great work in that field. And I really wanted to bring us all together today and to um, share this science and see if we could come up with a path forward. Thank you, Jenna. We are here today to ask our burning questions of some really great scientists in the field. In a headline culture where we read the headline and not the article, and headlines are meant to grab attention, not necessarily convey the um, details or the nuance or the subtlety of that article, uh, we are often um, beset with uh, different information that comes off as opposing and argumentative. What I'm hoping we can showcase today are three main questions that each of our panelists are going to be answering when they present. The first is, where do we have good confidence in this field of soil carbon sequestration? The second is, where do we know there are some bogus claims out there? And what are those claims and why do we know they're bogus? And the third one is, where are we looking to have more research? Where do we want to know more? What's uncertain? And then at the Q&A, I really hope you can all ask your questions and begin to understand um, a little bit more about how to read the science, how to read in between the lines of the headlines, and then how we can come together and ask the right questions in this field to continue to move us all forward. We're at a critical point in time where we can either be a fad and go away, or we can move into that mainstream and become business as usual. So I all think, I think that every one of you on this phone call is important in that moving from a fad into business as usual. So with that, we'll get started. I'm happy to have Jane Zilikova, a PhD in evolutionary biology um, and ecology from the University of Colorado. She is a scientist, advocate, and climate communicator. As she said, she is a lead scientist for Carbon 180. She is also a filmmaker, the founder of Hey Girl Productions, and the founder, co-founder of 500 Women Scientists, a group dedicated to increasing access, equity, um, and many other wonderful things in the field of science. Jane, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Keller Rose. Um, a couple of things before I start in the age of Zoom. Of course, there are people cutting the grass outside, so you might hear some of that. And also there's a dog and he's likely to hop up and get behind me on the couch. These are just the realities of Zoom world. So just wanted to give you a heads up when you see a brown dog behind me he's allowed to be there. Um, so I'm really excited to get started. I just have a few short remarks um, and then I'll be happy to sort of weigh in more on the science as we chat. And I prepared a short presentation just because I like visuals. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, please don't judge me for the number of tabs that are open. This is just the reality of, yeah. So, um, I'm going to chat just a little bit about the broader uh, movement in the regenerative ag space over the last three to four years that I've been working on it explicitly and talk a bit about sort of the what we know about soils and the capacity for them to remove and store carbon relative to what claims are being made in the popular media um, and and maybe help us find a critical lens with which we can approach both the science that's happening, but also some of the headlines that are being um, generated. So one thing that um, we can see is there is an over exuberance of um, soils can save the planet kind of uh, rhetoric. So from could paying farmers to store carbon help mitigate and save farms article um, to this solution to runaway emission starts with crushed rocks to podcast about sort of the potential to have a new cash crop, which is carbon, to articles authored by people on this very call, like Keith Austin, that climate uh, mitigation potential of regenerative ag is significant, 
to um, lots of other articles that really uh, tout the potential of soils to deliver a, so a climate solution. And, you know, a lot of times in the headlines and even in the articles themselves, there's not a lot of room for nuance and for understanding that um, this solution isn't the only solution and um, that even within the sort of this solution alone, there's a lot of variation. I'll just say at the top, um, the could paying farmers to store carbon help um, the climate and save farms. That article um, was, I forget where it was published. I'll look it up in a minute. But essentially this article was a bit of an advertisement for one particular company called Indigo Ag. I think we counted like 18 references to that company alone in that article. So, you know, that's a really easy way to sort of like have a critical lens if one only one particular company or solution is being touted as the solution. So there is an over exuberance of coverage of regenerative agriculture or soils. A lot of people are really excited. And I think that's a really good thing. I would say three years ago, talking about soil health, soil carbon and regenerative ag was still very mar much on the margins. And it's starting to become much more central to how we talk about climate and how we talk about policy. And um, I think the number of articles coming out about soil carbon has also increased over the last few years. So there's both kind of a convergence of um, popular opinion and attention being paid to these solutions and conversations about climate solutions in general. And at the same time, um, more and more articles coming out about soil carbon sequestration. So there's kind of a convergence of both, which I think is a good thing. But at the same time, we have a lot of art articles that are coming out that are kind of detractors to this idea that soils can be a climate solution. So this is literally from an email I received today. I subscribe to the Politico, the long game newsletter, which comes out every few days and it's a deep dive into a particular topic. Today's topic, for whatever reason, was actually soil carbon sequestration and whether or not we can be paying farmers to sequester carbon. And, um, you know, it sort of gives a, a both sides coverage to the topic, kind of describes that there's a lot of attention from corporate entities and from policymakers on this particular topic, what that attention kind of looks like, whether there is potential, and if there isn't potential, what the sort of like limitations are. So, you know, they talk about the fact that like delaying action is going to cost us and that while there may be some skepticism and some things we don't know, that these regenerative ag solutions make sense for lots of other reasons and should be deployed as quickly as possible. So I just want to give that as an example of something that literally came out today. And then we have the more general detractors, lots of articles coming out with headlines like this. So why we can't count on carbon sucking farms to slow climate change. This was published in the MIT Tech Review by James Temple. Then we have articles like, can carbon smart farming play a key role in the climate fight? Question mark, kind of throwing shade at the idea that we can actually deliver meaningful climate mitigation. You know, we have articles from um, uh, nonprofits like WRI that talk about regenerative agriculture, that it's good for soil health, but really doesn't have a lot of potential to mitigate climate change. These kinds of articles get a lot of attention. Um, Green Biz had an article that essentially throws shade at the idea that regenerative agriculture can deliver a climate uh, benefit. I was actually quoted in that article. Um, he, during the interview, Jan James Giles worked really hard to try to get me to say that regenerative ag wasn't going to be a positive thing. So there's sort of like this gotcha culture happening um, and nonprofits and journalists, you know, doing the work. Uh, doing the research, but also trying to grab headlines. And if we just dig a little bit into the James Temple article, and by the way, these, all of these headlines are literally from the last five months. So um, this, this is just like a crowded field. There's a lot of noise. And I think both on the exuberant side and the detractor side, there's kind of a need to stand out in what is a really noisy room or a noisy space. And so if we think about the James Temple article in this particular headline, it might appear that this article is um, essentially saying that carbon sucking farms or soils that sequester carbon can't slow climate change. But in reality, when you read this article, um, it's a lot more nuanced than that. He really speaks to the challenge of measuring carbon um, sufficiently enough to be, be able to pay for it at per ton basis in a carbon offsetting framework. And so it's not so much that soil 
carbon can't deliver, it's that the financial mechanisms that we apply are difficult to apply until we have a much better resolution on how regenerative ag practices affect soil carbon sequestration. So just to wrap up, I think science has a lot to say too. And part of what we're gonna be talking about today is understanding like where we fall on the science space. And I'll just say lots of articles coming out about this with lots of like really great thorough studies showing that regenerative ag practices can actually lead to meaningful soil carbon sequestration. But there are questions that remain about where and under what conditions. And so how we can be skeptical and bring the critical lens to this conversation is really being able to dig into the science as the foundation um, for how we make decisions and how we think about these questions. So maybe I'll pause there. Thank you, Jane. Um, and I really appreciate you sticking to your seven minute time limit. I'll remind the other panelists that each of you also has seven to eight minutes. Um, so we really appreciate you and I'm wondering if you could end your screen share. Yep. Thank you. Um, we, I asked Jane to kind of give us a headline because what we're hoping to do is increase literacy today. So when you see these headlines, what I'm hoping is that if you choose to read the article, you can learn more about what they're saying and what you know about it. Um, and really understand that this is an incredible solution. Uh, in San Francisco, when we did the climate change strategy, my slogan was zero, 50, 100 roots, zero waste, 50% sustainable mode share, 100% renewable energy, and carbon sequestration. We are away, we are moving away from the single solution, uh, one thing saves everything, towards a nuanced understanding of what it means to live as an ecology, as a collective, and the solutions that we can bring to the table. It's also really important that we don't allow these overblown claims to cause us to kick back and throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, because this is an incredibly important uh, solution for our whole planet and for all of us to be working on. So we're gonna now dive into the scientific presentations and we're gonna start off with PhD um, Jonathan Foley. So Jonathan's bio is very long and impressive. He's won a lot of awards. I'll let you look them up if you're interested. Um, but he is an author, a scientist, a climate communicator, an advisor to leaders in the sustainability movement, formerly the head of the California Academy of Sciences, and as he mentioned now, taking up and leading Project Drawdown. Jonathan, we're so glad that you could join us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Keller Rose. And uh, I, I want to uh, thank Jane for her presentation, too. I, I really appreciate the, um, the effort to create nuance here. Uh, because these are complicated topics and, and silver bullets just don't exist when it comes to the climate change problem. So we've got to look, I know it's a tired metaphor, but we've got to look for those little bits of silver buckshot everywhere we can. And let's see if we can find some today. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen as well and see if I can um, uh, share a little bit of a perspective um, today. And as I mentioned while I'm putting this up here, uh, I'm coming at this from the perspective of the atmosphere, um, maybe a little different than from the soil, because I know Wendy and Keith are much more uh, an expert on the soil side of things. So I just thought I would kind of maybe flip the perspective a little bit and ask from the climate's point of view, uh, what do we know and what do we still need to find out when it comes to soil carbon and regenerative agriculture? Um, but here's what we do know for sure, is that agriculture is a force that's changing the planet um, writ large. Um, for example, we know today that about 35% of the world's land surface is devoted to one thing, growing food. Um, most of those in pastures and a lot of the cropland is actually an animal feed. So the animal part of this is enormous. We also know that agriculture is a big player when it comes to the water cycle. Um, about 70% of water withdrawals and about 85% of global water consumption is tied to agricultural sector. So whether it's land or water, our food system plays a really big role in it. We also know the role of nutrients in managing manures and fertilizers is also a tremendous environmental issue as the flows of nitrogen and phosphorus have basically doubled and tripled through our biosphere over the last 50 years since the dawn of the Green Revolution. And this is compromising ecosystems, especially marine and freshwater systems globally, but it's also having a huge impact on the atmosphere as well. And then we get to the issue of climate change and people are sometimes kind of surprised that the role of our food system is so prominent when it comes to changing the atmosphere and changing our climate. But basically it's because of these three graphs. Um, we have multiple greenhouse gases in the atmospheres, not just CO2, 
but CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide are three really powerful greenhouse gases that are all warming the planet. And our land use and agricultural practices have been significantly uh, contributing to the rise of all three. Uh, methane in particular has almost tripled since the dawn of uh, kind of the industrial and modern agricultural era. And two thirds of that has been due to agriculture. Uh, so that's a huge issue. Uh, nitrous oxide, almost all of that is due to agricultural emissions. And CO2, it's a mixture of fossil fuel use and land use, primarily deforestation and losing soil carbon that's contributed to the rise of CO2. So the fingerprint of agriculture is kind of everywhere. And so we really need to think about how we farm and how we can do better to feed the world, but also reduce the impact it has on the environment. And it's really, uh, I think, pretty clear that the role of animal agriculture is crucial and how we need to do that better. Uh, just from a land point of view, 75% of all the land in production on this planet for some form of agriculture is either in grazing or growing animal feed. So it is a big lever no matter how we look at it. So let's go back to the atmosphere, though, and think about how we're changing that and maybe how we can change it for the better. Um, the atmosphere is receiving greenhouse gases from us. And these six little arrows that I'm showing are the six primary sources of greenhouse gases when we include CO2, methane, N2O, and fluorinated gases, and put them on kind of an equal carbon footing, if you will. Uh, these six areas, including agriculture and food, are major contributors to what we put into the air. So these are the sources uh, currently from our land use and industrial and energy activities. And you can see the food sector is about a quarter of climate change comes right from our food system, basically, in terms of the sources. But the atmosphere is not a passive entity. It is also having carbon removed, mainly by oceans and by forest. Uh, these sinks, uh, what's removing CO2 from the atmosphere, are natural systems today. There's no real evidence that agriculture is really affecting global CO2 levels yet, but it could, as we're going to talk about later. But this is kind of the state of the world for the last 10 years or so. And when we put in 100 units of greenhouse gases, we remove about 41 of them. It leaves 59 of those left in the atmosphere. And that's why they accumulate year over year, building up, causing more uh, climate change as we go on. So these are kind of the two levers we have in the climate system to work with, reducing the sources of pollution, but also enhancing the sinks that naturally remove pollution out of the air, especially CO2. So we have kind of two big levers to play with, again, the sources and the sinks. And they're really, really important. But they're important to keep separate because they're not equivalent. If we think of the atmosphere as like a bathtub, uh, imagine there's a bathtub in your house is overflowing, causing all sorts of damage you really wanna turn off the faucet before you pick up the mop. And um, if you're only using a mop to clean up the problem, you're really gonna be kind of chasing your tail. We need to reduce the sources and enhance the sinks together in a more nuanced, complementary way to kind of see how we can solve this problem. So when I look at climate change, I usually start with the sources and ask, well, how can our farming and regenerative agriculture maybe help us with this particular problem? How the emissions side of the equation are working, not just the sinks, because I think that's been kind of missed sometimes and we need to do work there too. So one of the things we need to think about is how can regenerative agriculture reduce emissions from let's say deforestation, from methane, that's gonna be a challenge, but nitrous oxide is actually a really great opportunity as well as some other emissions. And these are the big places that we need to think about. And at Drawdown, we've done a very thorough analysis of these are areas where agricultural and food system practices can dramatically reduce emissions. And you see in here, these circles, the bigger the circle is the bigger the solution. We have quite a few of these that are linked to regenerative agriculture, including regenerative annual cropping, conservation tillage, reduced uh, emissions from rice, and better nutrient management. So there's a lot of things in here that connect to regenerative ag that are really, really helpful in reducing emissions. But as we know, agriculture can also create maybe new carbon sinks, adding to the ones that nature is providing today, which are mainly oceans and forest. And perhaps we can add some more by putting into play all of that land that's under kind of working landscapes. And so a drawdown and other analyses have shown that yes, there is a lot of potential, especially if we use a broader definition of regenerative ag to include agroforestry, when we look at the kind of biomass above ground side of things, as well as on the ground in the soil, 
And we see a lot of different opportunities here of different practices under a bigger banner of regenerative ag uh, that can be really, really helpful. So we kind of have both levers, reducing emissions and enhancing sinks falling into this regenerative ag category. And of course, you're gonna hear a lot about the new uh, co-benefits of this. But being mindful of time, I, uh, Keller has asked us to also ask, what are the open questions we need to think about? I'd love to hear more in our discussion later about um, how we can really, um, I'll wrap up in a second, Keller, sorry. Um, how much can we reduce emissions from regenerative ag? Not just create sinks, but how can we stop the pollution before it even gets in the air, especially around nitrous oxide and CO2? And then of course, how big a sink can regenerative ag really be? Uh, we've heard some pretty extraordinary claims, but there's not really extraordinary evidence for a teraton of carbon yet, uh, but maybe a few hundred gigatons. There's quite a bit of evidence for that. Um, what are the benefits of doing this in pastures as well as croplands? Uh, the croplands don't have to overcome the methane challenge that you sometimes have in the pasture systems. Maybe we can work both of these and see some positive solutions everywhere. I think there's a both and here. Uh, we have to think about time. How long does it take carbon sinks to really rev up and store enough carbon that the atmosphere notices? And uh, what will eventually limit the ability of soil carbon to build up forever? We know that it eventually kind of asymptotes, um, saturates is probably the wrong word, but it will eventually slow down, of course. And are we limited by the amount of land, the amount of water, but also the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and time we have to build up soil organic matter? And then the really big thorny question is, well, how permanent will these soil carbon stocks be in the long run, as well as biomass? Can we maintain this, uh, let's say, new forest cover soil carbon into the coming decades? And how can we help farmers do that? That should be a really, really important question. And finally, in things that uh, I find a little bit concerning, uh, and we should question in this conversation, that there are some pretty big claims being made about how big soil carbon can be. And there's just some, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think we're lacking a little bit of that on the teraton range of the size of soil carbon, but much less than that, there's quite a bit of evidence. Um, I think we also need to think more about how we can reduce emissions as well as offsetting the ones that are there through sinks. And how can we put more effort towards, uh, again, reducing emissions from the source, not just in the sink. Uh, and bottom line of all this too, and I, I hope to hear you know larger conversation with all of us, is it's so exciting to see all this innovation happening and all this great work on the ground and in the science, in practice, in theory, everything. And obviously it will be very helpful to many environmental issues, including climate change, through lowering emissions and enhancing sinks. But we just have to remember it's not a silver bullet, it's one of many, many solutions we need to climate change. And I, I think we should be thinking about big both end umbrella here to see how we can contribute towards positive goals in the spirit of uh, making the planet a little better. So with that, I'll stop and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, really appreciate it. Wonderful uh, presentation and summary of the really strong and positive benefits and questions that we can be looking at in the scientific field as we move forward. Some caution on overclaims. And I uh, used to work for um, Wade Crowfoot, who now works for as the head of the Department of Resources for the state of California. And he was working for then Mayor Gavin Newsom. He always used to tell me, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And uh, I think that's a really good slogan for all of us to keep in mind today is that this is a really good thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's not let that perfect be the enemy of the good. So thank you for your presentation with that. And we'll, if you have questions, please hold them. We'll be able to ask the panelists questions at the end. So we're just gonna keep moving here. Uh, Dr. Keith Poshton is our next presenter. Dr. Keith Poshton is University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences, a senior researcher, um, at Soil Science and the uh, Natural Resources Ecology Laboratory at Colorado State University. He has over 280 papers that have been published. Um, his lab houses the web-based models, Comet Farm and Comet Planner. Uh, he is part of the National Academy of Sciences, the US Carbon Cycle Science and uh, Working Group and several other uh, distinguished, um, I'd say scientific <laughs> part of the IPCC award-winning uh, group of scientists. So Keith, I don't think you need any other further introduction. Yeah. Just take it away. Okay, thanks, Carla Rose. My wife's Italian. I wanted to say basta in there somewhere, particularly uh, coming after Jonathan. Uh, but um, 
I and I'll um, yeah, I have a few remarks. I I really appreciated Jonathan's uh, kind of tour de force uh, review of the uh, of the whole area, and so I I think what I'm going to have here is, is, is pretty modest. I wasn't quite sure about what, what to present the audience, but I really just wanted to kind of make some, some kind of general statements. And I thought also we were, you know, we've been deluged with a ton of good articles and things like this. So I thought, okay, these guys don't want to look at a bunch of tables and graphs and stuff like this. So I, I kind of did a, a, a verbal thing, but uh, I guess at the, at the risk of, uh, of, uh, you know, maybe preaching way too much to the choir. Uh, I'll uh, I'll try to just do a few brief remarks that hopefully will will have. Uh, uh, let's see, swap. And Keith, remember we have our big questions. What do we right. have questions in? What do we know is bogus? Yep. What do we need to? Okay, I'll 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 try to fit those in as well. Okay. Um, okay. So I and and again, maybe I, I think this is is perhaps too simplistic, but just really to to get some points across that that I think are, uh, yeah, that that I think are should be kind of consensus statements, but sometimes in in vis a vis the you know the WRI discussion and other things like this, I think sometimes we get kind of lost in the weeds and and. And, and there's a lot of confusion that's probably not so necessary. But, and I would just say, I think, you know, one of the main points, I think, you know, the carbon storage capacity on working lands is large. And I think that's an empirical fact. Uh, but, and that, that capacity is really, a, in a sense, it's a function of the large historic losses of carbon that we've had, you know, in the past. So there is, you know, room, if you will, in, in soils to, to, you know, put some of that carbon back. And it's, you know, Jonathan Sanderman's paper is, is a great paper and I think makes this point really well in terms of what this, you know, if you will, the carbon debt is. Uh, but just point out that, you know, we've, we've understood this pretty well for, for a long time. And, and you can go back and look at things like Hans Jenny's uh, classic book on factors of soil formation. And, you know, there's abundant empirical evidence uh, about this. Um, and at the same time, I think, so there's a capacity there. Um, and I would say we also know that there are a lot of practices, and I'll call them improved practices, that can increase soil carbon storage. And Jonathan made the great point, and, you know, I, I think for soil scientists, it's, you know, yeah, emission reductions are equally or perhaps in many ways more important. Uh, but I would, you know, so I would just say that, yeah, we, we also know practices that can reduce emissions. Uh, sometimes it's tricky, but uh, so, you know, we, there, there are ways to do this. Uh, in terms of just the carbon, it's, it's kind of a mass balance, uh, not to oversimplify it, but, you know, there are, the mechanisms are really, can we increase the carbon uptake by plants from the atmosphere and get more of that plant residue to soils and find the ways of, of reducing the relative rate of carbon turnover in soils that will, you know, increase the storage of, of carbon in soil. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, at, at that level, uh, it, it's, and, and there's lots of empirical evidence that we've got from, from long-term experiments that are out on the landscape that, that show that, that, you know, there's many different practices that can do this. So uh, it's not, you know, there's, there's not a, a huge mystery there. Uh, and I think in a lot of cases, it boils down to, we also have pretty good estimates of the, the kind of average rates of, of carbon accrual that are possible and a number of the, uh, the papers that Keller Rose distributed, you know, look at potentials from the standpoint of what kind of rates and if we adopted practices, you know, et cetera. So I think that's really, you know, there, there's, uh, I think the controversy that sometimes is about what's the, you know, what's the capacity and, and the technical potential is really, uh, you know, kind of misplaced. Uh, I'll get to th that being said, I think there can be, you know, exaggerated claims, if you will. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I think there's a pretty good uh, basis of evidence. As Jonathan said, you know, I think teraton is, is way over the top, but, you know, something much, quite a bit less than that is still a significant amount. So, 
Uh, the, 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 the nuance here, of course, is that, and this makes it difficult and sometimes for policymakers, is the results of different practices and stuff, they vary, and they vary by locality. And that is due to things, the climate, the soil type, the previous management, uh, so not all the practices work the same everywhere. So it's not that easy to just, you know, uh, to say, okay, this is what's going to happen if we do this. And we know that some systems, you know, can, depending on their circumstances and where they are and their history, et cetera, can store a lot of carbon. Uh, many can store modest amounts or at least a little bit, and some can't probably sequester any at all. And so if you look at arid, low productivity systems, it's really hard to boost the carbon storage in, in the soils and those things. Or you can take the opposite side and go to what's known as the black soil zone in, you know, central Manitoba, places like that, where, you know, there's already, you know, 10% by mass of carbon in the soils. They're, you know, they're called black soils for a reason. And there, you basically can't stuff any more carbon into those soils. So, so and, and what this means, the significance of this, of course, is we need to have data models, management practice standards that are geographically specific because there's not a one size fits all uh, kind of a solution. And, uh, you know, again, I think sometimes the, the, it seems like people argue about technical potentials over much. And I think really it's, it's about, okay, you know, what are the constraints to, uh, to doing this? And I think that is really, to a large degree, is, is about, okay, if we're going to do this in a big way, we're going to have to have widespread adoption of, of these kind of practices. And, what are, and there are constraints to that. It obviously hasn't happened on its own, or we wouldn't be having the discussion that we're having now. And there's a lot of different constraints uh, that, you know, to, to, to regen practices that can increase soil carbon and also reduce, you know, nitrous oxide emissions, et cetera. But I, my feeling personally is I, I don't think there are any showstoppers. There's like, no, this just can't happen, right? Uh, the constraints are things like knowledge transfer, institutional barriers, ownership patterns, labor, you know, economic constraints, at least to the short term and, and, and several others. And so I think that the key part of, you know, how much of this are we going to be able to do is really going to relate to a large extent how, you know, how can we improve, adopt policies, reforms that can overcome these constraints and how can we get financial incentives, which I think in most cases, or at least a lot of cases are really needed to catalyze this practice change. <clears throat> so, and I think that to, to me, then, the area I certainly work in a lot is, is you know, to do effective policies, we, we need to be able to understand what's happening. So I think we need reliable, low-cost performance metrics. Uh, my personal feeling is that we've got enough knowledge now in terms of data and models and decision tools to, to, to start doing more uh, aggressive policy adoption, particularly from, from government, you know, subsidies and stuff like this. Uh, but I think it's it's pretty well recognized, I feel like in the field at least, that we really, we do need improved quantification technologies that can increase the confidence in that we're really getting uh, carbon removals and we're getting emission reductions that that can really spur kind of the investment from, from, from the private sector in particular. Because I think the private sector in many ways is going to have to drive this if it's going to happen. In terms of research priorities, so this was one of the questions, but I think, for example, we need to, you know, we're going to get, far farmers have to adopt this and they have to know how to do it. We have to have research and, and improvements, you know, for carbon farm planning, if you will, peer-to-peer -peer producer networks, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that, you know, Jonathan mentioned, uh, you know, permanence. And so we really, you know, if, if we if we don't have systems that are regenerative systems, but also are profitable and farmers will want to stick to them once they adapt their systems and continue, then, then it's going to be difficult to maintain, uh, you know, the carbon storage that, that you attain. So I think we, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that I think that, that I've seen that, uh, you know, that regen practices can be successful this way, but I think we need some more uh, studies.
Uh, I think this is a little bit of a pet peeve. I think the U.S. government needs to really fund an on-farm soil monitoring network. They they had one that started a, a decade ago that got quashed in the in the budget sequester, but th that's a, a critical need. And then I think we need to have, you know, these kind of integrated, scalable quantification systems that that can meet that, you know, take that barrier away. Uh, and I, you know, to me, again, I think it's not so much the technical potential issue, you know, but if soil management is going to fail as a carbon removal strategy, I don't think it's, it's not because it can't be done or there's a lack of capacity. It's, it's going to be essentially because we as a society really chose not to do it. Uh, so that's, that's my, uh, those are my talking points, I guess, and, and I'll, uh, I guess I'll I'll close there. I don't know if if maybe I'll wait to discuss the, you know, what I think about bogus claims or or et cetera until after the. Uh... Yeah, let's put that at the end, Keith. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and uh, Wendy, I'm going to give you ten minutes since that's what Keith uh, Keith took. So if you if you feel like you want to have ten minutes, go for it. But Keith, thank you for the summary of understanding and really pointing out that it might not be here an issue of the science so much as the issue of our ability to cooperate as humans um, that gets this done. So really appreciate your background and all your work. It's incredible. Um, also for those of you who maybe didn't dig into the folders, the papers that Keith provided give great overviews and more simple language to this topic. So it's in Keith's folder and the Google folder. He has four papers in there. They're really great intro papers. I pulled a lot of talking points out of them. So take a look at those uh, if you get the time. Our last presenter is Dr. Wendy Silver. She's the Rudy Gras Chair and Professor of Ecosystem Ecology and Biogeochemistry in the Environmental Science Policy and Management uh, Department at the University of Berkeley. Wendy was also the lead scientist um, for the Marin Carbon Project and continues to be uh, an active member in uh, agricultural and soil carbon science and sequestration in the state of California. Wendy, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Oh, let's see if I can get my screen up here. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Great. And I apologize for my face disappearing, but um, I have two teenagers in the house that use a lot of bandwidth. Um, so, I'm just going to stick to the questions that Cala Rose asked us and, and build on what the other uh, two folks said. Um, the first question she asked us is, what do we have high confidence in from carbon sequestration science? And similar to what Jonathan said, we know that land can be a net sink uh, locally and regionally, maybe globally, although there's, there's more uncertainty at the global scale than there is in the local and regional scale. And we know that it can happen on an annual time step and maybe for longer. So that's what this graph over here is showing. And this is just the strict land sink. It's not, it's not thinking about land use change. It's just saying that we can put more carbon in land. If it were negative, it would be emitting um, than, than uh, goes into the atmosphere on an annual basis. Um, we also know from modeling, um, and this is, key because we're taking data and then making assumptions about it and putting it into computer models. We know that if we were to take the practices that we already know how to do, similar to what Keith had talked about, and we apply them at the places where they could be applied at a global scale, we could have a significant impact on the atmosphere. So it will contribute. It won't solve climate change alone but it can contribute to climate change mitigation. And that's both from the perspective of removing carbon and from the perspective of lowering emissions. But those, both of those have to happen simultaneously. And forests are really, play a really key role because they store a lot of carbon in their wood. Maybe they store some carbon in soils too, but it's nowhere near as well quantified. And soils in uh, grazing lands, because of their huge extent um, hold considerable potential. And soils and cropping systems do as well, although it's, it's a little bit more dicey because there are practices that result in soil carbon loss and you can store carbon for years and then reverse it you know, in the course of one or two years by changing practices. 
So there's there's some unknown in that. Oh, let's see. Let me see if we can get it to go down to the next one. There it goes. Okay. I just wanted to mention the amendment part of it because that's what that's how I got into all of this. You know, there's been a lot of work looking at um, carbon sequestration with practices that are shift, making relatively small shifts in the ecosystem, shifting the number of cows on the land or reducing tillage, but still tilling or adding cover crops. And all of those things have been shown to have the potential to increase carbon storage. They may not um, decrease emissions simultaneously and there's not very much data out there on the net effect. The reason we started to look at soil amendments and particularly compost amendments was because we're taking carbon and nutrients from a place where it's emitting a lot of greenhouse gas and not storing any carbon and putting it in a place where it's reducing the emissions of greenhouse gas and storing carbon in the soil. So you don't need a ton of science to figure out that that's going to come out ahead. Um, and we use life cycle assessment models and lots and lots and lots and lots of data collection to make that work. It doesn't work everywhere, but it's kind of one of those things. If you add carbon, you're likely to get more carbon. And there's a lot of uh, interesting science questions still to go, but, but that's kind of a, an easy one. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is um, to think broadly um, and to have the data to think broadly. Scientists, as scientists, we tend to focus at, on our plots or on our set of plots um, where we've done some sort of treatment and it, we tend not to think outside of that envelope. Um, but with <clears throat> climate change, it's really important to think about upstream and downstream effects and how that might Im impact uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon storage. And so I, I'm a huge, um, fan of life cycle assessment modeling and collaborating with people across disciplines. And I think that's really, really key, you know, getting the ecologists to talk to the engineers and the managers and, and others to try, to try to think more broadly. What's unsubstantiated um, and, and, and what's just downright false? Um, there's a difference. There's some things that people are saying out there that really don't have data to back them up and we just don't know if it's true. But then there's also things that we know are just plain false. Um, so one thing is, if you see a sentence that says, if we can just fix X, climate change would be solved, um, you can be pretty sure that that's not true. Climate change is a complex problem, and a single solution to climate change is very unlikely. I think we can leave it at that. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So beware of big numbers like the Terraton initiative that got us all going because we thought, wow, none of us could, could use any, any scientific basis to come up with a number like that. You know, or, or some kind of special treatment that will work you know, outrageously well, like heard micronutrients or, gee, if we could just keep water out of the atmosphere, um, then we would solve the problem. And you know, from an ecological perspective, those things just, they just won't work. Um, and that brings me to the third point, which is if it doesn't meet the rule of first principles, it's likely flawed. And when I say first principles, I mean that science builds upon itself and there are tenets that have been over time shown again and again and again to be fundamentally um, true and how, how the world works. They're often based in, in, in basic concepts of chemistry and physics and biology. Um, science builds on these basic principles. And if it doesn't meet, if, if, if an idea doesn't meet the, the rule of first principles, it's likely to be flawed. Now, there are breakthroughs that, that shock us all, but all of those breakthroughs are based on past work. They just may have been based on it in a way that nobody thought to put it together. So, Think back to the first principles. Is this biologically, physically, chemically possible? And if not, then you should be suspicious. Okay, what are the next steps and research needs? Well, we need way, way more data, way, 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 way more data to be able to, to have confidence in, in what the best practices are. And it's amazing how far we've come 
Um, I know that's an overwhelming thing to say that we need way more data, but the reality is just in the last couple of years, we've moved so far forward in, in what we have confidence in. It, just a few years ago, when I was starting to do this kind of work, people didn't think that we could detect a significant increase in soil carbon at large spatial scales on annual time scales. We now know that we can, no problem with that at all. It takes a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of, of, of labor and a lot of work in the laboratory. Um, so I think that one of the things that, that we really need is to develop new remote sensing and continuous sensor networks coupled with machine learning to help us build a better understanding of how ecosystems function. Uh, the technology, it now, a lot of the technology now exists and we just haven't applied it necessarily yet in, in the ways that I think that, that we can. So I think that's one of the future areas that's gonna be very exciting um, to see develop. And I think it's going to change the way that we think about ecosystems. I think it has to be coupled with on the ground measurements, which is going to be very painful because to validate this, this, these new techniques is going to take a lot of, a lot of direct measurement, but we're, we're getting there. And I think that this is going to transform our ability to make decisions and our ability and our, the ability of, of producers to be able to adjust to changing environmental conditions. And so there's a feedback there to, to the, the co-benefit that we, that we cannot absolutely cannot forget, right? To our producers and to our food growing systems uh, and, our, and our fiber growing systems of, you know, how do you both um, slow climate change and adapt to climate change? And having continuous information that allows people to make adjustments in their management will, will go a long way to helping us keep the systems moving forward. So with that, I will stop. So we have time for discussion. Thank you so much, Wendy. I really appreciate you sticking with your time and giving us a great overview of what we know and have enough confidence in to go forward and where we are looking at more data being helpful. Um, so I just would uh, ask everybody to keep in mind that um, science is multifaceted, right? But it's also one facet of the many solutions that we do. And we, when we know enough, we support producers in education, we support uh, policy changes, uh, we support cultural, um, you know, uh, ideas and imaging, fantastic fungi comes out today on Apple, which is really exciting as a movie. Um, you know, there are lots of different ways in which we support this movement. So when we hear things like we need more data, which what we're saying is that in science, as we go forward, we need more data. Again, just to like change up our thinking, it's not to say that we can't act on what we know now, that we have enough science to support the implementation of that work now. So again, just keep in mind that we are in one of the most complicated spaces dealing with a very complex uh, ecosystem and topics. So let's open it up for questions. I have one to start us off. You know, um, I, I saw in the papers that I was reading, there actually seems to be a pretty good consensus about how much carbon we can draw down um, and one of the things that I saw was missing was that the compost amendments are often not included uh, in these practice estimates. And so, Wendy, I actually had a question for you. What is it that you think needs to happen in order to move that broader discussion of amendments into the literature more broadly? Right. So the, 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 there's a couple of reasons why that's not there. One is, one is that um, there's not the global scale data set that there are for other standard practices like tillage or reducing, you know, cover crops. Cover crops are very widely used. They've been, they've been, um, you know, put out there with extension. People have, have been sampling it for a long time, but you know, we just don't have that yet for for compost. And and that's not to say that people haven't been applying compost to their lands. They have. There just haven't been scientists following behind them and sampling soils and looking at changes over time. So there's a couple of review papers that, well, there's one review paper that's out. There's another one that, that we're working on that hopefully will be out soon, you know, but there, there's 10 studies. And, and of those 10 studies, maybe five of them are really rigorous. So we're moving in that direction. Um, 
I do think that you can still model these dynamics at larger scales, and most of those big synthesis papers are modeling papers. Um, but you know, that's the main reason. It's, it's just not the 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 number of you know studies in the in the fifties to the hundreds to the several hundreds like there are in some of these other practices. Great. Okay. And thank you for that answer. Okay. So. I've got a couple questions coming in now. Um, we'll start with one from Pricinus Ranch. What is the effect of creating deeper topsoil on a limit to the carbon that can be sequestered in soils? Um, maybe Sally, you could expand on that question. Yeah, it's just, I often wonder this. I understand there's, uh, depending on soil type, there's a limit to the carbon that can go into a given volume of soil. But as I understand it, the like the topsoils of the Great Plains were made deeper as a result of their interaction between plants and soil. So is that not possible and therefore affects what an upper limit might be, that we can actually create a deeper topsoil with higher soil organic matter than we start with? I'll take a quick stab at that. I, you know, I think because one of the things that we we understand is that it, at least in in what we refer to as mineral soils, so things that aren't like a peat soil, a peat soil is something different, if you will, an organic soil. But in mineral soils, a lot of this the ability of carbon to be maintained longer term against microbial, you know, oxidation is is interaction with the soil minerals, particularly clays. And so you're right, as if we have, uh, you know, if we can get more carbon down into deeper into the soil, then we can, I, th I think you're right, you know, we, we can expand, uh, you know, soil carbon sequestration capabilities. And, and that's one of the reasons why you do get more carbon in things if you do a prairie restoration, for example, than if you're doing something else. But, you know, that being said, there still is a, you know, there's still a finite amount of, of soil carbon that you can obviously stuff into a soil. But, uh, but I think for the kinds of amounts that people are talking about is as looking to for soil carbon as as a again a, a wedge solution within a broader portfolio of carbon removal that really that capacity is not kind of the limiting factor itself Does that answer your question sally or did you have a follow-up no that's that's great thank you very much okay great i'm going to move on then to there's a couple of questions around private sector and understanding um, what's the role of the private sector, what, from a scientific perspective, what's the role that the science, uh, excuse me, the private sector could play in moving these practices forward? And then specifically, I think this is important. Um, there's a question about anecdotes. Are anecdotes enough to build on to an inevitable thesis? And I think I just wanna take a moment and clarify here that I think what we're seeing is that it's not just anecdotal, right? There is significant evidence for practice-based solutions that we can move on now. Um, and if, if you're referring to anecdotal within your own ranch or your own farm, you know, if it's working uh, and you might want to prove it out, um, that might require some science. As Wendy said, a lot of people use compost. There hasn't been a lot of science done on that compost. So just to understand that when we're talking about proving something out in science, we're talking about a specific pathway to pursue that, the scientific question and endeavor to pursue that, to get that paper peer reviewed and published, that increases the rigor of the science. We had another question about rigor. So I'll open it up to the scientists to say, to ask to answer this question, how is private capital going to play a role or the private sector in these practices? Maybe I can start since this is like part of what I do at work. Um, so part of what we're already seeing is a significant interest from corporate um, sustainability offices and like large companies that are either setting really ambitious climate goals or interested in reducing emissions and also removing legacy emissions, emissions they've put out into the atmosphere. And removing legacy emissions, you can't do with emission reductions, you have to actually draw down and sequester carbon, um, which is something you can do in soils. So I think part of what the private sector can do is provide the capital 
to facilitate the transition to practices that we know in general, on average across the US can lead to significant soil carbon sequestration. Whether that's done through some sort of um, corporate sustainability programs or um, some other financial mechanism, I think there is a lot of research that, like currently we don't have researchers that work on carbon offsets, for example, but there's a large body of scholarship around the role of financial markets carbon offset markets, et cetera, in delivering climate benefits and environmental benefits. And I think that uh, in general, that scholarship points to a lot of issues with existing carbon offsetting markets and points to some potential changes that can be made to actually facilitate meaningful carbon kind of emission reductions um, and at a cost that can be, that can deliver profits to farmers themselves. So I think the, Corporate interest is really important and, and I think it can provide that like first mover capital that farmers and ranchers need to transition their operations. In lieu of that, there is also a large um, role for philanthropy and of course the federal government, which has the largest sort of financial lever that can be pulled to facilitate the change. But corporates actually have a pretty large um, role to play both in terms of like financial investment and signaling the importance of something. To the public. Maybe I can add to that too. Uh, I, I totally agree with everything Jane just said. I, I guess just um, a lot of companies ask us a drawdown about offsets, which is different than like sequestration, but um, the economics of soil carbon sequestration just in the verification ability of knowing that those are really locked up as an offset are, are kind of problematic uh, compared to let's say paying somebody to eliminate refrigerants from you know, a supply chain or harvesting them from landfills or something like that, or paying people to install solar panels somewhere else. Because you can really point to that and measure that. It's easily verified and this kind of thing. So the economic challenges are, are, are quite different, I think, between like an offset where you're introducing renewable energy to somebody else or you know, getting rid of another source of emissions versus creating a carbon sink that you, you, know, you don't know who's gonna be farming that land 10, 20 years from now, right now. Um, we just, I think the mechanisms in the policy and economic space are gonna be a little troubling uh, at first. And we need to sort that out because there's a lot of money going towards this. Um, but it's just not the economics, it's also the politics. Uh, I've never met a politician in America who didn't wanna give money to farmers. Um, it's really, play, even Republicans wanna do this and um, right now in the US Senate. So um, I don't know, I think we have to think through very carefully about you know, the permanence issue, verification, accountability, things like this. So we don't create a kind of house of cards. Um, a lot of you might remember too, you know, the Chicago Climate Exchange and the interest of no-till agriculture with glyphosate back in the 90s as a carbon sink. We've been here before, folks. I mean, the idea that companies would pay farmers to sequester carbon is, you know, was, and Keith and others will remember all this stuff. And we kind of went through a bit of a hype cycle where it kind of got overblown and then kind of dismissed for a while and we waited a bit and now we're back again. I think we just want to be really careful about like, you know, what are the real, where does science policy and economic interests really meet constructively? And um, as Kyle Rose saying, let's not let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Um, I don't know, I don't have a real answer here, but I just think it's gonna be a little complicated and there's a lot of, um, a lot of nuance there as well, not just in the science. And it might be that the offset is not the right mechanism for this particular solution, but as you heard Jane say, and you've heard many people say, what farmers need is upfront capital. And so any way that that capitalization can take place is great. Right now, it's very hard to get a loan to transition from corn and soy to regen ag because of the way the financial system is tied to the crop insurance program. So pr private capital that's coming in, either whether it's at a community bank or a small equity firm, you, looking at ways to help farmers capitalize, they will do this work. Farmers are smart, they're hardworking. If they're offered the technical assistance and the support to do it, they'll get it done. The financial issue really is capitalization. How that capitalization takes place in an economically efficient manner is really important to ask. Maybe we're hearing that offsets aren't the best way to do that for this particular solution. However, I think that there's a lot of innovation that could come from the private sector in terms of capitalization. Uh, that could be offered for farmers who are looking to transition to get loans to transition and things like that. I just wanna read something from Keith out loud here because this question um, about how do we tell what science is good science from Jane, uh, Keith said there's three things to really keep in mind. So peer reviewed published documentation is necessary but not sufficient in and of itself. Secondly, the science needs to be replicable 
i.e. can you do it again or was it just a one-off finding? I know that that was a challenge with a lot of the grazing studies was replicability. Uh, the third thing that we need to keep in mind, at least at a rough level, according to Keith, are what mechanisms are involved. So peer-reviewed, published, repeatable, and then as Wendy was talking about, does this research build upon existing first principles and mechanisms that are known in the scientific literature? Um, so that's three good points to keep in mind when you're looking at, does this science hold up? Thank you, Keith, for that. Um, Sally adds, in addition to capitalization, we need to think as a society how to mitigate risk for farmers in making these transitions. It's an excellent point. Um, that risk might be social risk, might be cap social capital in their community, it might be financial risk, uh, it might be the risk of learning from someone and then that technical assistance provider goes away. So how do we really surround farmers to reduce their risk in multiple levels uh, to move this forward in addition to capitalization? Perhaps there is a role for the private sector in some of those areas as well. Um, I think Matt, there's- Can I just like say something real quick? Yes, um, not that I think science is the solution to every question. It's not like a hammer where like everything looks like a nail. Um, but I do think sci science can help address some of the issues around risk by, by helping provide evidence for what likely outcomes are and sort of constraining the, the solution space or the realm of possibility. I think also science can help underpin some of like the corporate expectations. Like if people understand what the issue is that they're delving into, it can help like set the right level of expectations for what they should expect, how long that carbon is going to stick around. And similarly, science can really be the foundation to inform a set of policies that can actually address real problems that farmers and ranchers are facing rather than like the problems we think exist. So like, I think science can actually be applied across um, all of the spaces in different ways. Yeah, can I, can I add that too? Um, sorry, I, I hope folks are realizing like, like you have four scientists here who are all talking about this kind of stuff. and we're in like vigorous agreement, even though it might not always seem that way. Um, I think the scientific community is pretty unanimous in saying, yes, there's real potential here for soil carbon to contribute to some of the climate change solutions we need. Um, they're not as huge as some people are claiming who have financial and ideological interest at heart, but here we have a group of people who live and breathe data every day and who don't, aren't making money and aren't, don't have some ideological bent. So, you know, scientists are worth listening to. They shouldn't drive the bus, as Jane is saying too, but, you know, we, we should be on the bus <laughs> maybe with a map telling you, you know, hey, go over there. Uh, but we also need farmers and everybody else in the room and politicians and all the rest. But I think there's a lot less controversy in this space than might appear in the media. And I would ask us to kind of remember that. And, you know, I, I find it kind of this weird uh, on Facebook, we have arguments about this, but in the scientific literature, it's like, yeah, yeah, they're pretty much in agreement, um, more or less, and with some still open questions. But it's when you hear these kind of wild claims about like, you know, methane isn't a greenhouse gas or something like, yes, it is, sorry, you know, that's physics, you can't deny that. Uh, or, you know, that we can't infinitely build soil forever and ever and ever, of course not. Nobody who measures this would ever claim that. And so, you know, there's, there's some kind of basic things we all kind of agree on in the science. And if we just stick to that, we're really good. We're really good. It's just the kind of extraordinary claims. And you get asked, like, what's motivating them? And it's usually money or ideology, um, I find. Um, anyway, I, I find it refreshing that the scientific community is actually really pretty much on the same page, plus or minus a little bit. And with a lot of what we don't know, yeah, but it's still, the basics are pretty well known. Thank you, Jonathan. Um... I, that's a really wonderful point. And again, just to point out to everybody, the fact that we are all in agreement and not arguing on this call is really great. Um, so the one thing that I, so two questions that I wanna ask before we wrap up, one was about marine soils and I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss that. So the question from John Doyle, is there a role for marine soils in carbon sequestration and how will rising sea levels affect the integrity of lowland soil carbon sequestration? I would love to comment on that one. Um, in the state of California, they are um, uh, reclaiming areas. I don't know if that's the right word to use. Um, it, coastal areas that have been protected from salt water with levees, and they're taking down the levees and reflooding those as part of a climate change mitigation activity with the idea that if you flood them and turn them into wetlands, um, coastal wetlands and brackish and saltwater wetlands that you'll build carbon in soils through 
the formation of peat. And um, we and other groups have been measuring greenhouse gas emissions and carbon gain on those. And they're a net carbon source. They appear to be a net carbon source to the atmosphere for a little while because when you flood it, it goes anaerobic and the, the critters that make methane go crazy. But after a few years, um, the methane uh, production slows down and the, the carbon gain increases. And of course, it's gonna vary where you are in the country or where you are in the world. But there's now pretty good evidence that, that if you stick with this for a while and with sea level rise, it's hard not to stick with it because it's gonna be hard to keep those lands from getting, getting wet or getting flooded that you can actually sequester a fair amount of carbon and that can be another, an, you know, another part of your portfolio. Um, the bad part in California is that that's taking agricultural land out of production. Um, so it's decreasing our food production and that's a real concern, but it is one potential uh, use for coastal lands that are likely to get flooded with sea level rise. So Wendy, does that mean that there is actually a potential to restore lands if we do it consciously with sea level rise? Right, right. I mean, I, this is what's happening in, with the delta is that those regions are actually below sea level, um, in some cases many meters below sea level, and um, because they were drained for agriculture a hundred years ago. So that's different than in some areas where water is just creeping in, you know, annually is getting, we're having more flood events or, or just more common inundation. Um, but it's the same general idea in that if you take those lands and you, you restore wetlands, and in this case, they're actually, there's now, you know, companies that have the protocols to do this well with, you know, planting at the right, at the right times with the right species. Um, to really build carbon quickly, you can do it. it. You have to stick with it for a while to to balance out the methane emissions in the early phases, though. Great, thank you, Wendy. Okay, so uh, Carl, we'll just end with your question here. Um, and Wendy, thank you for your great science on that. I know you're working on some projects in the Delta, and it's awesome to hear about that. Um, so we'll end on this question from Carl Burkhart from One Earth, from a communications perspective. Effective. It would be terrific if we had a shared position, maybe on how much we think we could get from carbon drawdown with this solution. Would 100 to 200 gigatons uh, be a somewhat in the ballpark? Um, I'm going to open that up, but before I do, I just want to say uh, this is where I think we should bring in some more nuance. That framework we have for carbon accounting is really based on technology in the energy sector. And like, um, like Jonathan Foley said earlier, it's really easy to show reductions in refrigerants over here with a particular technology or increase in renewable energy over here with a particular technology because we are working with a natural biological cycle and we're talking about flows and stocks of carbon and not necessarily a complete cessation as in the case with the technology replacement sometimes these comparisons get challenging. So I would just encourage us to all think about, yes, we wanna qualify this and quantify this within the frameworks that we have, but also that the frameworks that we have may not give sufficient weight to the types of tons we're talking about over here when we look at sequestration. So to open it up to the scientists, I'm gonna do quick uh, 10 word answers or 20 word answers from each one of you. Would it be appropriate to say between 100 and 200 gigatons through 200, 2100? Um, and just to look at, do we want to lock in on those numbers or not? So Jane, I'll start with you. Um, I think the literature that I've read and including all the papers that were shared puts it around that one, 120 to 150 maybe. Thank you. Um, Jonathan. I'm going to share a picture and just shut up. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. That, that's, this is a, uh, an analysis we're doing right now, just kind of a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. Um, yeah. And that 100 to 200 range um, is probably a reasonable number. Great. Thank you. Keith? Yeah. I, I, I think that comports mm -hmm. with, again, a number of studies, but I, but, Again, it's really important to say that's kind of the 
technical potential, if you will. That's the biophysical potential. Hey, if we all did the best practices, we could achieve that. And of course, if for whatever reason, practices don't change and nobody adopts this stuff, then nothing's gonna happen. So that's, the, that, that's to me the, the big important message. Right, great. And Wendy, um, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, the one thing I'd like to add is, I, I agree with what everybody said so far. I, I just want to add one other caveat, and that is that those meta-analyses that this is based on is based on our knowledge today, or really it was based on our knowledge yesterday, um, right? So, because it takes a while to get stuff into the peer-reviewed literature. So, so this is, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it's kind of old information, and the new information is being generated now, and it'll be generated tomorrow. So you, you got to keep an open mind and be flexible um, as we get more information and people test new practices and people innovate. So, um, so I think that that's a good working number um, for now. And then just keep your eyes out and, and, and keep in contact with your favorite scientists to get updates. Wonderful. And hopefully we'll see those uh, compost numbers and some of those lit reviews soon in the future. So I want to thank you everyone for being on the call. A special thanks to our panelists for donating your time and effort for this. Thank you so much. Um, Jenna, thanks for hosting. And this will be recorded and sent out. Feel free to share with people you think might benefit or find it interesting. And um, uh, just keep up the conversation. Let's keep talking.